Okay, welcome to Comic Book Pros, presented by the Lake Como Comic Art Festival, an interview show where we talk to some of the most interesting and creative comic artists working today. I'm your host, Scott Doonbeer, ready to take you on another ride through the colorful world of comic art. Comic Book Pros is sponsored by the Lake Como Comic Art Festival, and I want to tell you about what makes this thing so special. Join us May 17th to 19th for three days celebrating comic art against the stunning backdrop of Lake Como, Italy. Are you ready for an unforgettable experience? Whether you're a seasoned comic collector or just dipping your toes into the world of comic art, the Lake Como Comic Art Festival has something for everyone. Who says you shouldn't meet your heroes? At Como, you'll have the chance to meet some of the biggest names in the industry legendary artists, writers, creators, and with only a thousand attendees, you'll for sure have the opportunity to meet and interact with your favorites in real life. Don't miss out on this once in a lifetime opportunity to celebrate your love for comics in the picturesque setting of Lake Como. The Lake Como Comic Art Festival is happening May 17th to 19th, 2024, and tickets are limited, so reserve your slot today. You can find tickets and more at www.lccaf.com. That's www.lccaf.com. Don't miss out on this exclusive event. Today, we're speaking with the incomparable Tula Lute. For those who are not familiar with Tula's work, you are in for a treat. She is a true visionary, renowned for her colorful and energetic renderings with engaging and robust style. Tula is part of that rare breed of artists who can unlock raw and powerful emotions in her characters, creating stories that are astounding. Her portfolio is brimming with stunning illustrations and narratives that resonate deeply with readers. What truly sets Tula apart, though, is her ability to infuse each panel with a sense of depth and subtle nuance that leaves readers spellbound. Whether she's depicting her unique vision of Batman, helping create indie titles like Somna, or illustrating color silk posters in the NBA. Tula's original work is breathtaking. We are so excited to have you on the show. Welcome, Tula. Oh, thank right. you. It's very nice intro. <laughs> well, I think it's I think it is well deserved. Thank so <laughs> I wanted to ask you a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? You're you're in England, right? Yeah, um, so I'm in Northern England, uh, Yorkshire, uh -huh. uh, Yorkshire born and bred. I was born in Harrogate, um, and I currently live in Ilkley at the moment, which in England that's famous for the moors, Ilkley Moors, um, where kind uh, of okay. in a valley between the moors and um, uh, the woods, Middleton Woods, which is where my house is, right on the edge of the woods. And it, it kind of looks a little bit like Bronte country, where very – very near to Haworth and all of that. The Rolling Moors, Heathcliff and Cathy. Nice. I, I've spent a lot of time in England. I, uh, um, I, I used to live in London for uh, about a year in 1986, and I uh, had a great time, and I've been back a lot of times since. I have a lot of very close friends who are uh, in England. Um, yeah. So were you a comics fan growing up? Yeah, um, I've always loved comics. Um, my my dad used to take me to the market to buy like comic book seconds, like all the um, sure. all the old newsagent issues that used to get pulped. Um, they'd be sold off cheap before they were pulped, so you could get them super cheap on this on this market stall in Batley Market. My dad would always go there every Wednesday and buy his boxing magazines, and then he'd give me like twenty p to pick my five comics, and I always pick same ones um it was always the qual quality comics which was the american reprint of the 2000 ad judge anderson stuff um and um there was the x-men comics uh the chris claremont paul smith stuff at the time um frank miller's daredevil and um well so it was like star wars weekly um but the sure. it was like return of the jedi weekly for me and the the things that I really loved other than the Star Wars stories were the Marvel adaptations in the back, like Sinkovich's Dune or Archie oh, yeah. Goodwin, Al Williamson's Blade Runner, all of those things. Oh, beautiful like, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it really yeah. was like a, a golden age for me. Age like I think I started like age seven picking up all this stuff. Um but because they were comic book seconds, like odd issues that were about to be pulped, um, I, ne I never had a full run. I just had like 
in between stories sure. on and off and you know that that doesn't happen nowadays like you can you have whatever you want at your fingertips things are very easily accessible with the internet and ebay and stuff but when i was a kid it, it's like if you couldn't find an issue you wouldn't have it and you you might spend decades trying to get hold of it and so it kind of made it very special sure sure uh, it, it's it's it can be fun jumping around like that you know when i was a kid it was kind of the same thing you know local comic shops they were there weren't comic shops really but you know you'd have to ride your bike for miles to go to each store to see what what issues they had um and actually um just a, a minor segue uh, i actually worked on quality comics when i lived over there in 1986 i was uh, an editorial assistant resizer on uh, judge dread on steve dillon's work oh so, my god that's but, amazing uh, it it, uh, it it sounds more amazing than it actually was, but it was it was a lot of uh, a lot of fun. It really was. I had a great time while I was over there. Um, so you had mentioned some of the some of the uh, uh, stories that you've read. Can you cite any influences that you had, you know, growing up and and even more recently? Because you know, obviously, you know, art artistic cha taste change all the time. Yeah. Um, I mean, weirdly, a lot of the artists and art I loved growing up has still stuck with me now. Um, so I I was very much like, as I was saying, when I started reading comics as a kid, you know, I had people like Frank Miller and Klaus Jensen, Paul Smith and, you know, all these all these incredible artists, Brian Boland on um, on the 2000 AD stuff. Uh, you know, it really was a, a golden period for art. And I still look to those guys a lot now. But kind of uh, as as I was growing up with those comics, there was this transition happening with, um, with the kind of so-called... Um, you know, Marvel comic books for comic comic books for kids, um, kind of moving over to a, a new kind of comic for teens, where you had DC creating Vertigo. I was just getting into reading, just on the cusp of that. So suddenly you have like Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon doing Preacher. You have oh, Sam. Great, Matt, great stuff. Peter Milligan on Shape the Changing Man, and um, you know, Death with Chris Bacalo and. Um, all, all these books that were just really incredible, that were really inspiring me at the time. Um, there were just so many great things coming out from um, DC. And before that, um, uh, Marvel were doing their kind of more arty line epic where you had um, still still one of my all-time favorite um, miniseries, Meltdown, with Ken Williams and John J. Murph. Um, oh, gorgeous I, stuff. Yeah, I still look at that now. I love it. And, you know, they were publishing a lot of um, Sinkovich and and Kent Williams stuff around that time. And, you know, where you, you're getting this art that's painted and it's massive. And at the same time, Dave McKean on Arkham Asylum and then doing Black Orchid. And, you know, I, I still sure. look to a lot, of, a lot of that stuff now. I, I really adore it. And, like, just uh, just a few years ago at San Diego Comic Con, I managed to pick up a John J. Muff page of um, the Dracula large format adaptation he did. I don't don't know if you remember it at the time. It's so sure. beautiful. Yeah, Symphony in Moonlight and Nightmares. I think it was called. Um, yeah. I really I really love that. That's hanging in my bathroom now. I feel like it needs a better place than in my bathroom, but it means I get to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see it every day. But um, yeah, that and I was a big fan of the work he did on M also. Uh, on what? Which, um, M. Oh yeah, yeah, that was so yeah. good. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Tremendous talent. He actually did a. Um, uh, I I edited a book called Global Frequency that yeah. uh, Warren Ellis wrote, and uh, Muth did one of the issues, a really beautiful one about angels. That uh, wow. was his black and white work, not his color stuff, but yeah. just really yeah. gorgeous. But yeah, and, and his black and white stuff is incredible too. He's he's such a great artist. I I wish I wish he'd do more in comics. He's I love his work so much. Yeah, no, I I I don't disagree. Um, 
So talking about your art, you have a really beautiful and distinctive style. Can you talk about your creative process a little bit? Like maybe you could run through how you construct an image from the initial concept to the finished piece. Yeah. If you don't mind. Um, yeah, of course. So I, uh, I always use photo reference, work from photographs a lot. Um, you know, ju- just like a lot of my favorite artists too, like John J. Murphy, I always remember with Wolverine and uh, with Meltdown, he used James Jean for Havoc and Greta Garbo for Jean Grey. And it's it's just so beautiful, the expressions that, that he used. And it, it's got a very vintage feel because of that. Um so um, with, within my reference, I use, um, when I'm doing sequential art, I tend to not just draw draw a sequential page and scan it and go straight from there. I tend to draw a lot of images that get put together once they've been scanned. And I kind of really work out the story as I'm looking at the images and using them. Um, I always use uh, pencil and charcoal. Um, well now I am for the last few years I've been using pencil and charcoal and then instead of using well charcoal and then powdered graphite so instead of using fixative on the charcoal or the powdered graphite I use like a cheap hairspray that you can get in the in the UK sure Um, and and I I started using that because it was a lot cheaper because fixative is (laughs) and I used to be like a poor student um, but I discovered that in using this very cheap hairspray, it's very watery, but it, it really kind of sets sets the charcoal. Once that stuff is dried, you can't get it off anywhere. <laughs> it's like this massive right. protective barrier. But 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 because the um, hairspray is so cheap and watery, it tends to it runs down a lot and it brings a lot of the charcoal with it, and that creates this kind of drippy, grungy effect, which I love. So. You end up, I end up drawing the pencil image and then kind of covering it in the charcoal and then in, in spraying it and fixing it, you end up with a lot of these happy accidents where you get these beautiful textures coming out. Sometimes the, the line art almost disappears within that. And then I work it back into it with white acrylic to bring that art out again and or scan it and work into it digitally to bring it out again to make the line art come out but it ends up looking quite different to the original photo reference I was using um, and then with those scans I uh, move them around on the page if I'm doing sequential art and then I color it all digitally I use a lot of what watercolor washes like colored watercolor washes to to color it oh that sounds that sounds great so so each panel is done individually and then you composite it in photoshop yeah, I mean, yeah, not not always. Like, if I, I've just I've just come from working on Barnstormers for Comicsology and Dark Horse, and then Somno mm-hmm. with Distillery, and so there there will be times where I just do I do draw the page and it gets scanned and it stays exactly as is. I don't need to do anything to it. But um, because I want to get a lot of detail into larger images, I'm used to having maybe like one panel on a page so it's very large and then scanning that and placing it with other panels. But then I tend to find that at that point I can move things around more, I can tilt panels, I can change things or add things and uh, just make it a lot more interesting rather than having to get the composition right straight at the beginning. That's that's sort of what uh, Kyle Baker does with uh, his projects nowadays. Yeah, same same kind of thing. So, yeah. can you tell us what what was your first published work? What uh, how did you break into comics? Yeah, so um, because I've always loved comics, I've always worked in comic book shops, various comic book shops, and then I started Pop Bubble sixteen years ago while working at Traveling Man, the comic shop in Leeds. So. I've always been around people selling and creating comics. Um, So when you're in that situation, you're a retailer or a festival organizer, you get to know a lot of people in the industry. Um, So especially with Fotbubble, it was around the time that 
social media was really taking off and I, I got a, a Twitter and an Instagram and because I've always drawn for myself and done some freelance illustration in the past, I just started um, posting my own artwork up on my Instagram and Twitter um, just because it was an, another way for me to just create my art and put it out there. Um and I never really expected anything from it. I never really thought I was good enough. I just drew for myself. And um, because I knew a lot of people in the industry around that time through the shop and the festival, um, people actually started seeing that and saying, you didn't tell us that you were an artist and that you could draw. And I was kind of surprised. I was like, oh, well, I never really thought it was good enough. I just draw for myself and I've always drawn. I love art and I studied art. Um, and very quickly after that, um, people like um, Will Dennis um, came to me and offered me some work with Vertigo. Richard Starkins um, asked me to do a cover of Elephant Man. I think that was my first ever comic book cover. And he asked me to do a story within one of the issues of Elephant Man. I think it might have been issue 54. That was my first interior right. art. And then around this time, it kind of all happened at the same time. Um, Gail Simone got in touch and asked if I'd do a short story in Scott Snyder's American Vampire Anthology. And I was like, oh, my God, yeah. And then nice. Adam Hughes like DM'd me on Twitter saying, uh, I love your work. Do you mind if I pass your work over to Shelley Bond at Vertigo? Oh, wow, like, that's great. Yeah, it's just crazy. <laughs> like all these people that I love and like Adam Hughes, I've been following his work, you sure. know, for years and years before, you know, his amazing Catwoman covers and his Tomb Raider covers. He's like a total master. So to have yeah. these people like, get in touch with me privately and kind of encourage me in what I'm doing and also pass my work on for me to actually get paid work. It it was like, I just remember at the time thinking, what's, what's going Like, this is, this is my dream and it's, it's just, it's just happening. It's, and I couldn't be happier. It's like, it's not stopped. I still have sure. to pinch myself every day. You know, I want to make an observation, and that is you were talking about you never felt you were good enough. That, to me, personally, is the mark of a good artist, you know, because you never find an artist who says, oh, this is just the best in the world. I'm so great. Well, there is one exception. Frank Frazetta thought very highly of himself, and you can't really <laughs> fault Frazetta. But no. pretty much everybody else who thinks they're just the best generally has isn't um but you know i find that the that my favorite artists are always the ones that are pushing themselves more and more and it sounds like that's what you're doing too yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely and um you're always kind of wanting to try new things and try and get better and then every time you look back on the the work you did two years ago you're like oh I'm not sure about that anymore. Whereas people still seem to love it. That's nice. But, you know, when I was first, when I first started out, I was using like inks and then I moved over to pencil and then and now I'm using charcoal and, you know, I'd really love to do more multimedia stuff as well. Um, sure. So I'm, ju I'm just really excited about all the possibilities. Like, Working on Somna, the book I've just worked on for uh, with Becky Clean and for Distillery, we're working on very um, large format pages. And so that's kind of another leap in the way I work and something that's really exciting because suddenly, you know, when you're working in a much larger format, you know, it's really nice to get that extra detail in there. And sure. it's just been really lovely to do. So... I, I do want to talk about your work in Thought Bubble, but first yep. I, I just have a just have a question for you, and that is, you use a pen name, you know, like Frank Quitely uses a pen name. I'm just curious, what made you decide to do that? Yeah, so um, when I was talking about the beginning of social media with Thought Bubble at the time, um, I was wanting to get a, a Twitter and an Instagram, and I actually wanted to create a website where I could just load my work up um, and just start posting regularly. Um, 
but when I went when I went to get it's this is a, it's a pretty boring story really. But when no, I went no, to get no, 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 we have some time. Go ahead. My my actual name is Lisa Wood, and there's like a million artists out there called Lisa Wood. So in terms of having an identity online, it's impossible. Like people can't find you. It, it's really sure. difficult. So I kind of thought if you if you just make make up a name, if you make up actual words, nobody is going to replicate those words, and it becomes unique to you. So. On search engines, on Twitter, on Instagram, no one else has your name. You've you've got a completely unique tag for people to be able to find you. So around the time I was watching a film called Smoke and Cigarettes by John Turturro, mm-hmm. and the one of the main characters in it is called Chula, and I really like that name. And um, I was thinking, well, that's a really nice name. It feels right. So I'll take that. And then I was sat in the traveling man office working with my best bud Nabil kind of talking about it, like in the swivel chair. And uh, I was kind of saying, so I got, I want to like create a new name for, for my artwork online. I think I'm going to have Chula, but what should my second name be? And Nabil just swiveled around in his chair. and <laughs> He looked to me and he went, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like yeah <laughs> it was just so right. random and made up but it's worked <laughs> that's a that's a great story yeah. um so i wanted to talk about thought bubble which yeah. i've never been to thought bubble but from what i hear it's more of a european style show you know closer to angoulême or luca or you know one of the really nice art festivals and um uh, part of the reason you began thought bubble was to promote comics to children with difficulties reading and i believe you have ex- some experience with that can you talk about yeah. that a little if you're up for it yeah absolutely so i'm dyslexic um and i really struggle at, at school um, I can read or write properly when I left school. It was that that like it it was like in the seventies and eighties, and dyslexia wasn't really recognized. So you kind of just sure. got called stupid and put in the side class where they could ignore you a little bit. Um, and so the way the way I managed to um, learn and teach myself to read and give myself an education really is through comic books. Um, because they spoke to me a lot more like at school that we'd be picking up books and reading books. And that was just like a jumble to me. I couldn't deal with that. And my dad was p- picking all these comic books up from me, from the ma- for, for me, from the market. And, um, suddenly I'm able to look at sequential pictures with facial expressions and things going on and smaller bodies of text where the writing is a lot clearer. And it just, made it very easy for me to be able to pick up what was going on. And because I loved the subject matter so much, I kept trying to learn more, trying to read. And um, that really was the beginning of my love from like age seven. Um, And, you know, it was like I, uh, in my teens, I went to an all girls school. And so reading comics there was just like absolute no, no, like, I was just an oddball and I didn't really have many friends, but I still had my comics that I would love and kind of copy artwork from them and teach myself drawing and everything I was doing around these wonderful stories. So they, I really owe a lot to the medium and through working in retail and various shops, we didn't have a comic book convention in Yorkshire. And I was speaking to my friend, Nabil Homsey, who owns Traveling Man. And I was running it with him at the time saying, I, I really want to put on a comic show and I want it to have a, a quite intense educational aspect where we can um, ask people that we know, writers and artists, if they will come in and give um, workshops to young people and to adults with with issues as well, um, and um, take it from there. And I, I was kind of expecting a few hundred people to like attend the first show, and maybe it was something we'd do for a couple of years and leave it. But it was it, it became so massive so quickly that it really took on a life of its own and we suddenly get 
got funding for some of the workshops we were running and we had a massive amount of support from Travelling Man and Diamond Comics and started at Book Crossings where Diamond Comics would give like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of books away to us for free to distribute to libraries. That's great. Yeah, in disadvantaged areas where children can't access books as freely. So it it really it really kind of stemmed from that. It's um it it's been amazing how warmly it's been been received by everyone and how creators in the industry that you know quite often don't get paid a lot and when they go to a convention they give their time for free. Like how right. generous they've been helping build up the show and give their time to people that really appreciate it and that have taken a lot from it. It's, it's really heartwarming. Well, you know, it sounds like you've done a tremendous job with thought bubble and you have done so much for kids. And because of that, you were recognized as a recipient of the Bob Clampett humanitarian award at comic con a few years ago. And that must've been, that must've been wonderful for you. Yeah, it blew me away. It's kind of, uh, you got that little thing uh, uh, again as well, uh, you know, with my lack of confidence, there's always that imposter imposter syndrome there. So having that award given to me in my name kind of felt a little bit wrong because it's Thought Bubble has always been so much more than just me. You know, there's been all the people that have helped to make it what it is um uh, over the years and so i what i did accept that award on their behalf i'm just one person within that organization but still it's um it it blew me away i was crying a little bit and yeah just very very happy to get that you know the fact that you recognize that so many people are involved but you are the face of thought bubble um you know, it, it's nice validation also. So congratulations. That's really Thank you. nice, nice story. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to segue a little bit. Um, you did, you know, fairly recently, last couple of years, some really gorgeous posters for the NBA. How did that come oh, yeah. about? Yeah, so I was speaking to the guys at Read Pop. Um, I really wanted to go to New York Comic Con, but it was late in the day and they didn't have a table for me because it was so late. Um, but those guys are always super helpful and they were like, just let me figure something out. And they were actually working with the NBA at the time. Um, and um, Mike Negan, who was running Artist Sally, kind of came to me and is like, this is going to be a strange request, but we actually need <laughs> with the NBA at, at New York. And I think, <laughs> I think he was expecting me to be like, I don't draw baseball, but um, I, actually, <laughs> I actually have very, very fond memories of sports illustration through my dad because he was a massive sports fan and really into boxing. Um, and he would buy so many magazines and books with these incredible illustrations that um, it, it just really appealed to me on that level. Like my dad had passed away just before then. And in my head, I was thinking if if he could see me doing this, it would be something he'd be really proud of and suited about. And so part of me a little bit was hoping is looking down on me, watching me draw some baseball, <laughs> basketball players. I'm sure he would be very proud. But, yeah. Um, so you've done a wide variety of projects for a myriad of publishers and so many characters, Batman, Su- uh, sorry, Batman Supreme, Bodies. Any favorites that really stand out? Yeah, um, I mean, drawing Batman and Poison Ivy was a big thing for me. It was um, a real pleasure to work with Scott Snyder on that because I love his writing and he's so lovely. We get on super well. Um, so it not not only the fact that I got to draw those two characters, but it was for All-Star Batman where we kind of got to reinvent them in a way. Um so that that was really lovely because um, I got to create a new outfit for Poison Ivy and create a new way that she looks and 
kind of rewrite her story a little bit, maybe not make her as much of a villain, but a bit of an anti-hero. Um, and then I got to play with Batman's suit a little bit because the whole scene takes mm-hmm. um, place in the desert and he's kind of always in this heavy black rubber. I was thinking, wouldn't it be a good idea if it was like a Fremen suit where there was kind of reflectors in it and a water supply, like a cooling water supply, you know, all the gadgets he has. Oh. So that was super fun to draw. I love that. Um, I mean, because I've mainly done a, a lot of covers, um, there are some covers that I've really enjoyed um, working on. Like I did some connecting covers for The Walking Dead for Robert Kirkman. And that was like when the deluxe color issues were coming out with Charlie Adler's beautiful artwork in color. Um, that was a lot of fun to do because that's a great series. Um, doing a Black Widow cover was great and doing some Wonder Woman and Catwoman covers. So I've done a few of those in the past that I've really enjoyed. Um, yeah. And also, you know, working with Warren on... Um, supreme blue rose like that was the first large larger sequential um art story that i did and those characters have always stuck with me diane from that and i had a lot of fun drawing those and i still look back on that series very fondly i'm really proud of it i'm uh, i'm a big fan of warren and uh i hired him at wildstorm to do planetary and the authority and uh um he he always does such great stuff really wonderful stories but anyway um so somna somna or somna 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 okay uh you're working with what you're working with becky cluden what's that like oh it's i mean it's it's an amazing it's an amazing story and um, I also want to point out that there's a hardcover collection coming out in July. But anyway, go ahead. Talk about the series. a little. Yeah, so um, it's been amazing working with Becky because we're really good friends. And I just love her to bits. We get on so well. It's like sometimes we've got identical brains, but <laughs> we just like <laughs> exactly the same stuff. But I always joke with her that I'm like the potato version of her supercomputer because <laughs> she's like, she's so <laughs> And I'm just there tagging along going, hello, Becky. Uh, but she's, <laughs> <laughs> she's amazing. And um, we started talking about the story like maybe 10 years ago. Um, we went to uh, Uppsala Comic Con and um, we were exploring Sweden and uh, literally walking on top of some massive Viking burial, bound, bur- burial mounds. And um we started uh we started talking about this story. Becky had this idea and she was talking about sleep paralysis and I was like, Oh my god, you know, I used to have waking nightmares and we kind of just went down this hall of ideas. How cool would this be? And then um she kind of had this idea of a story and the ending. And then I was like, Well what what if we you know, what if we make it like a witch finder general and uh, and so it kind of went went from there and um we've just kind of been talking about it on and off for those 10 years and then when distillery came about it just seemed like the right time to do it we were talking about possibly doing it with other publishers but because it's erotic um we had to be careful and not everyone wanted to print that i think people did but they wanted it toned down a bit and we never really wanted to compromise on that so when distillery came about, especially because they were going to print in a larger format, it just couldn't have been more perfect because we really wanted the art to speak for itself in this book. We wanted like a lot of detail in there and it was a real labor of love. So yeah, it kind of just blossomed from that and we've actually finished it now. So issue issue three is going to be out later this month and then that's the end of it. I say it's free issues, but they're large format, so each issue has around fifty-six pages. So it's technic it's technically a six-parter. Um, but yeah, it'll be it'll be collected, as you said, in July. So yeah, it's been amazing. Oh, we've had a lot of fun well, with it. Yeah. Well, good for uh, good for the both of you for sticking to your guns to uh, making it the project <laughs> you want to do. You know, because really. 
especially with a creator own book, it should be your vision, not the publishers. Yeah. But um, speaking of somebody who works for a publisher, um, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So uh, are there any other projects that you'd like to talk about that are coming up in the near future? Yeah, well, um, I am working on a book at the moment. I can't really talk about it yet because it's not announced, but it's a book I was working on um, before Somna. I'd done the first issue, and then I paused it to get Somna out, and now I've gone back to it, and um, that's going to be out, I think, in the fall. Um, and it's with a writer that I really love. It's an amazing story. It's actually erotic horror again. Um, but it's uh, set among the backdrop of the satanic panic. So it's, um, yeah, it's it's going to be pretty edgy again. Um, and that will also be a creator-owned book. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a creator-owned. And um, I, I probably can't mention what publisher it's with at the moment. But it's I think okay, it's all right. The announcement will be coming out in maybe like two months. Nice. Oh, good. Then you can talk about it uh, at uh, the Lake Como Festival, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah hopefully. Yeah. Can't wait. So um, I wanted to ask you, as a female artist in comics, which is predominantly male-driven, although thankfully that's changing, do you have any – advice or words of encouragement for young women cartoonists or writers who want to break into comics? Yeah. I mean, I feel like, you know, it, it has always been male dominated, but I think that's changed massively over the last five years. And especially when you, it look has. At, yeah. When you look at um, stories that are published online, you know, pe- individuals with their own patrons and creating comics online, and um you know like digital comics as well there's like a massive amount of female creators there um i think the same as anything um if you want to do what you love just don't compromise just keep working for yourself keep drawing for yourself make it come from the heart because as long as you're feeling it and you're creating stuff that you love, I think that will speak to other people. Like at the beginning when I was trying to, you know, I, I loved comics so much and I was always trying to like replicate this incredible, these incredible black lines that you'd see in Marvel and DC. And if that's just not me, it held me back and it made me feel like I couldn't do it at all. Um, but really I'm doing right now exactly what I should have been doing back then, just drawing for myself and drawing in the way I wanted to rather than trying to draw a house style. And I think that that's the key, really. As long as you're doing what you love, you know, you can you can have other jobs and just, like, do it in your free time and, like, build it up or, you know, go – go to into further studies to learn more about your craft but as long as you're doing what you love in in your own time i think it will show yeah i you know i i i did have just a feeling of sadness when you earlier were talking about um not being necessarily accepted at your all girls school for liking comics you know i'm glad that i'm glad the world has changed so that isn't hopefully as much the case nowadays but yeah I mean I I don't think that's the case at all anymore but you know when when I was at school it was like it was not just comic books I was I I just I've never really kind of gone with the flow and fitted in with like the norm of the time it's like I was always down in the garages like riding my bmx or watching lord of the rings animated or just stuff that no one else around me was really into or doing and i I think that's partly kind of informed what i do today the fact that i've got these really kind of strong loves that i've just always embraced and kept at and it's kind of led me down a path where i've ended up doing the things i want to do because of that Nice. So um, I win in the end. We should... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, 
<laughs> so um, um, we're gonna get, we're gonna start to wrap it up a little bit yeah. um, because God knows I can just ramble on forever. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's talk about uh, Lake Como and the and the Comic Art Festival. Are you looking forward to it? Yeah, massively. So um, I think I mentioned this to Arno when I saw him. Like, I've never been so impressed with a, a show. Like, the the only other show I'd been to that isn't Fort Bubble uh, that really kind of celebrates artists in a big way is Heroes Con in North Carolina, and I love that show. Sure. And I've not been to many of, of the other European shows, but then when I came to Como, it's like this – just really incredibly beautiful setting and then within it you get like the powerhouse of every like hero of mine on the planet under one roof and I've never seen that before so obviously as somebody who is a big big fan of comic art and these people like actually exhibiting there was just crazy. The fact that I could walk around the corner from my table over to Dave McKean and just buy an original from him. (laughs) And I can tell you now, I not only spent all the money that I made at Como there, but I actually ended up owing money. (laughs) I bought so much stuff. I was like, it it in a sweet shop. Well, it sounds like a wonderful show. I, I've never been, but uh, I will be going this year. So I look forward to meeting you at the yeah. show. And uh, yeah. and Tula, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for talking with us. And uh, um, have a safe trip to Como in a couple of months. And good luck with everything in the future. Thank you. Yeah, see you there, Scott. Great to talk. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap, folks. We've reached the end of another episode of Comic Book Pros. A huge thank you to Tula Lotte for gracing us with her presence and sharing her incredible journey. Remember, you can explore more of Tula's stunning creations by visiting tulalotte.com and following at Tula Lotte on Instagram and X. I'm Scott Dunbeer, and as always, it's been an absolute pleasure guiding you through the world of comic art. Comic Book Pros is produced by Rami Atassi and Remzi Atassi. The show is edited and mixed by Mason Bendetti. Don't forget to subscribe and watch every interview on YouTube at Comic Book Pros or listen to the podcast on your favorite platform. Follow us on Instagram and X at Comic Book Pros for updates on future episodes. Until next time, keep dreaming, creating, and exploring the fascinating world of comic art. Goodbye for now.